Okay, now our um, next presentation is by Thomas Lomé. He's the founder of Infrastructures, which is um, with he defines, which he defines as a pragmatic and utopian design studio that applies the design of product, service, and system design as a tool for change. He's also the initiator of the Open Structures project, a hands-on design experiment that explores the possibility of a modular construction model where everyone designs for everyone on the basis of one shared geometrical grid. Alongside his activities as designer and as a design researcher, Thomas has been teaching at the Social Design Research Program at Design Academy and Oven's Master Course, and he's the co-founder of the Ensimatique Program at the NC in Paris. Um, he will talk about his project, Open Structures, on the potential of open modular design. Thomas. Uh, hi, everybody, and uh, thanks for inviting me today. Uh, so my name is Thomas, and I would like to talk about the Open Structures project. Um, we started this project about seven years ago, and it's actually a very simple idea. Uh, what it wants to initiate is a modular construction uh, system that works according to the Wikipedia model. So what we mean with that is that we no longer envision one designer or one company designing a complete modular system, uh, protecting it and then selling it uh, to the market, but we rather want to investigate the potential of a modular system where actually everybody who wants can contribute some parts to a central database of parts, uh, components, and structures. Now, Wikipedia is doing this as well. They're building one encyclopedia, but of course, it's written by all of us. And uh, in order to do that, they use HTML. And HTML is the common design language that enables us to uh, write articles, but also to read articles of others and to edit them if we feel like it, to improve them. Now, what the Open Structures uh, model proposes is a geometrical grid of, that is built up out of four by four centimeter blocks, and that uh, defines certain assembly points by taking the diagonals of these blocks. This is then used as the uh, common design templates by all contributors. So we made this kind of um, uh, grid that is, uh, and we uh, spread it around. And what you can see here is all different parts that are all have been designed by different people, all using their own uh, production techniques, whether it's 3D printing or whether it's just taking a wooden block and drilling holes in it, or whether it's laser cutting. So all of these parts, they all have a kind of a different signature that is um, very much connected to the one who made or who designed the part. But as you can see, they're all based on the same grid and therefore they're all compatible with one another. So you can just uh, assemble them together in order to form certain objects. So what you get is you get a modular system but that no longer has a uniform identity. It actually introduces diversity within modularity. Now these components or, and these parts are then assembled into objects. And uh, what has come out uh, by doing this project, by experimenting with it, is um, very various uh, objects, ranging from kitchen appliances, furniture, uh, vehicles. Um, we looked into interiors, um, closets, racks, uh, scaffolding systems. And we're even now looking into what could this mean for architecture? What if we see architecture as an open modular puzzle rather than a static thing? So basically what you get, or what we also notice is that what is different from uh, the objects that we're used to uh, see and that we used to deal with is that these objects are no longer static, but they rather behave as dynamic puzzles. So that means that they are kind of, uh, they have the ability to, to grow with the user. So the user is, 
it makes it easy for the user to adapt them, to personalize them, uh, to improve them, or just to take them apart and uh, reuse certain components or certain parts in different objects. So they're puzzles. So how does this work? Um, at the center of the system, there's no longer the object. At the center of the system, there's the part. Uh, as you can see, this is a part that has been designed 2012. Here you can see how the part relates to the grid. And this part is floating. The first person has used this part, this is, uh, has used this part to design a swing. This one, this one was done by Kisana Hugner. The swing is then passed on to the next person who takes the swing apart and converts it or uses this part in a sled. So he, ju he just designs some extra parts uh, and assembles them into a different object. The sled is then passed to the next person who takes it apart and uses certain parts uh, for a suitcase that he designed. And again, he adds uh, certain parts, certain new parts that he would need in order to make the new object. So you can see that the object is constantly, or yeah, the object is constantly morphing from one uh, object to another, and uh, the components are floating within this um, time sequence. Here you see the parts again used in a modular cargo bike. This is my bike, and I drive around with it in Brussels. So it's also for us, it's also very important not only to test the things, but also to use them. It's, and it's also actually uh, necessary to, in a way, destroy your own designs, because if you don't take them apart, then they're not going to evolve. So it's a very, for a designer, it's a very weird thing to do. But it's also kind of freeing, which I'll talk about later. So again, you, what you get is not only dynamic puzzles, but what you also get is kind of object families objects that um, are somehow interdependent to one another and um, reinforce each other. So what we see is the more pieces that are generated, the richer the system and the more opportunities we get. So that's the object. Now, in order to facilitate this exchange, in order to facilitate the floating, of course, now we have the internet. So we develop this kind of online tool to um, facilitate the discussion, which is openstructures.net. How does that work? Let's take, for example, this design. This is a sand digger. It was designed by Tristan Kopp and Ricardo Carnero. Again, it uses the same part as what I showed to you before. Imagine you don't make this. You just buy this object for your kid uh, just as a normal product in the shop. And what you notice is that if it's a open structures, if it's an open modular object, it comes with a certain amount of information. It shows you who designed it. Uh, it has a database number. Uh, and it also has a certain title. It's actually the information that is added to the object that is all completely dependent on what the designer wants to uh, put on the object. But what that allows you to do is to go to the website. And if you could now maybe switch to the website, then I could show you how it works. So if you, if you go to openstructures.net, uh, what you get there is you have a kind of an online database of all the parts that have ever been generated. I can quickly go to the next page. Here you see that the, yeah, the pieces are represented in a slightly different way. That's also because it was a different person who uploaded those pieces. Um, you see how they also, how they relate to the grid. And what you also see is uh, in which components they have been used. For example, if you take this part, it has been designed by Lucas in 2013 in Belgium, and it has been used in this components. So if you click on that component, then again here you get information on that component. You see what parts have been used. Uh, you can also see how the designer has uh, uh, protected this design. So I give all the, all the designers have the opportunity to either fully copyright it or keep it completely open. That's actually up to them. I think it's important to give them that choice or to let them make 
them this choice. You can download the SketchUp file. You can play around with the design. You can uh, make, uh, you can improve this design if you would like to. So that's basically what this uh, database allows you to do. If you now go back. What you can also do is you can just uh, look for certain keywords within the database. If we think about the sand digger, it was designed by Tristan uh, Kopp. So if I type in Tristan, then you come to um, the profile page of the sand digger. Again, it has a short description and it shows you which kind of parts it's using. Now, if you click on the part, you can again download the SketchUp file. But what is also interesting to see is you can also see what other people have been building with it. So imagine I have this sand digger. My kid plays with it for four or five months. Then after that, he's sick with it. Normally what happens with these objects is uh, they land up or they end up in the garage and they stay there for the next four or five years. Now what you could do in this case, if you could just um, click, for example, on the suitcase, um, see what extra parts you would need. In this case, you would need this wooden handle. Here you could download the DXF file, which would allow you to go to your local Fab Lab and to print out the pieces that you're missing and to um, reassemble your sand digger into a suitcase. And it would also allow actually the person who designed the suitcase to maybe get um, a small, uh, receive a bit of money for the, the part that was downloaded uh, from you. So that also he earns a bit on this. So actually what this system or the ambition of this system is to create a kind of economy in which actually the wealth that is generated is shared by the people who contribute to the system. So everybody who uploads things, who um, contributes, who improves parts is somehow also maybe has an opportunity to create some revenue with this. So it, this for me, I think is very important because this is also a bit uh, going against what is happening nowadays where you see huge conglomerates who um, develop uh, huge systems that suck up all the wealth and is actually uh, destroying the middle class, which is very important for a healthy society. So that's a bit the ambition of this system. If we could now maybe switch back to the uh, to my presentation. Okay. So that's that's the online platform. So we had the object, we had the service, and the third element in the object system is the space. This is a picture of uh, my studio in Brussels. This is actually uh, the first open structures workshop, you could say, and what this represents is a kind of physical database uh, that holds all the parts and all the structures. So apart from the online database, I think it's also very important that we create some new kind of places uh, where people can come to uh, take their things apart, uh, reconfigure them, uh, adapt them, maybe design new parts, meet other people, uh, exchange parts, and so on. Now, of course, this is quite a kind of a ambitious uh, uh, idea. So rather than waiting until I, I have everything, all the questions solved and all the money I need to really um, establish this kind of big place, I decided to already start up, start up this place and to just once in a while or every four months invite another person and ask him to play around with the system and then to see, okay, what is working in this place and is it working like how I thought it would work and if things don't work, what, how could it be improved? So that's actually really how we work. Like, uh, it's the same thing with the objects, it's the same thing with the online platform, it's the same uh, thing with the space. These are all, let's say, um, prototypes. This is really about beta testing the system in order to learn and in order to improve and in order to really move into a system that can truly be realized. This is Fabio, I asked him to, to work with the system. He came up with this part, which is a kind of a, an adapter part between a PET bottle and the grid, as you can see. This part was then passed to Dries, which is another designer. He used this part in his 
design or in his proposal for an open modular coffee grinder, as you can see here. Part was uh, passed to Jesse, which was another person who worked in the studio for some months. He actually improved the part, so it would actually now truly work, not only pretend to work, just as how you would improve a Wikipedia article, so um, things self-improve over time, and he would use it in his design for a open modular water boiler. Was then again passed to Dries, the water boiler, the whole object. Dries is uh, experimenting with 3D printing ceramics. He's of Unfold, maybe you know the studio. So he proposed to 3D print a water filter. So what you got was a water boiler filter, basically. And what you also got was an object that no longer had one designer, but that had three designers. And what you also saw, what I also thought was interesting, was that this object was evolving over time. So just like species, um, who kind of uh, evolve to their changing context over time. Also, these kind of objects, they start to evolve based on who is uh, handling it, who is busy with it, also based on the context in which they are put in. So, modularity is really all about uh, integrating time within design. Why? So, why actually all these efforts, why this project, why... Um, what is the potential of, of, uh, of an open modular system? Or, or what would I think would, is the potential? First, what could be in it for all of us? And this is a question, of course, because at this point, it's still very much uh, a research. It's still very much a question. But the potential that it could hold for all of us is from an ecological perspective, as I've been explaining before, because everything is compatible with one another, it makes it easier to reuse parts and it makes it easier to exchange parts with one another. From a social perspective, it, stimul it stimulates collaborative and thus exponential innovation. Again, because everything fits with one another, it's easier to um, merge things together and to kind of create uh, a dialogue. So not only a monologue, but very much a dialogue between all contributors. And with that, I'm not only pointing at the end user, but I'm also very much pointing at the, the, the producers, the manufacturers, that also there they look at, okay, what is happening with the products that uh, they're, they're producing and how could they kind of uh, create a dialogue between, between them and the end user. Now, from an economical perspective, what this does is this, uh, an open modular system could create new opportunities for um, services and spaces that deal with the second life economy. Because these objects behave like puzzles, because they have a simple and transparent construction, uh, it's easier first to take them apart. And because a lot of other objects are using the same kind of, are scripted in the same manner, it might become more interesting to take them apart because maybe these individual parts still have value for other people. Maybe it's easier to, again, sell them to other people. Um, apart from that, the potential of a new, new kind of spaces, new types of libraries, as you, you could call it, uh, which I also explained with the space in Brussels. So these are all, this is, these are all the, the big, let's say, the big potentials, but also the big questions marks. You know, it's, it's kind of exciting that it has this side to it, but again, um, it's still to see if that is really going to happen. But what I do know, what I do know by doing this project for six to seven years, is that it also, as a designer, it puts you in a completely different um, position. And it creates a different kind of creative processes that actually for me have been very uh, just interesting, just personally. First of all, from uh, it creates a, a new kind of uh, perception. We as designers, we have been taught, we have been learned to um, make very quick judgment on things. I like it or I, I don't like it. I think it's beautiful or I think it's ugly. But actually, with if you look at modular objects, they're actually because they are never finished, because they're always adapting, um, you no longer ask yourself the question, do I like it or not? But you ask yourself the question, what could I do 
what kind of changes should, changements should I make so that it would work for me? So it's a completely different way of engaging with your built environment. Secondly, it also stimulates you to experiment with things. If you, we come from an industrial era where the designer had to design a product that would then be mass produced. If something is produced, um, let's say, 100,000 times, it just has to be perfect. If something is modular, it might not, it might not need to be perfect because maybe somebody else just takes it apart and does different things with it or somebody else just takes uh, a specific part and, and uses it yeah, in a way that you completely didn't imagine. So also there this kind of uh, pressure of having to be perfect is kind of out of the way and it frees up uh, space to just do things. Autonomy, an increased sense of autonomy because these things this, the objects I've been showing you, they're not, they're far from perfect. They are not uh, very aerodynamic. They're maybe not hyper efficient, but they're also non intimidating. It's not that you think, I can't fix this. They all kind of convey the feeling like, okay, I can, I can take this apart and I can uh, maybe, you know, use this part there or adapt it or make it work. So, it kind of makes it, it lowers the border for the end user, not only designers, but maybe also people who normally wouldn't engage with their built environment, uh, to just um, deal in a different way with their, with their objects. And it, this might give rise to, again, these kind of spaces, spaces which I very much uh, miss nowadays. Collaboration, so again, this idea that, um, that it becomes easier to just uh, to build things together, to exchange parts and to start a dialogue around a project. Also the idea that you put something online, maybe four years later you check back and you see that your thing has become something completely different, also there. And all of this experimentation, perception, collaboration, autonomy, all of this, it generates a uh, process of self-education by doing this project, by just looking differently at things, by talking with other people about certain uh, project. It just it enrolls me in a process of uh, of uh, self-learning, and I think for me, that's the big promise. This is uh, this is really why I think this project is worthwhile. So I would like to finish my talk with uh, a quote that I found in World Changing, which, is, uh, which used to be a blog and then became a book on sustainable thinking. And this is their definition of an ecosystem. It all works together or it doesn't work at all. And I think this is very much also what we're trying to do with the project. How could we generate an object system that contains objects, spaces, and that is kept together by an online service that facilitates the dialogue between all the stakeholders and how could we generate a system that generates wealth uh, for all of us. Thank you. I, I would just like to add one thing, please, if you would, f uh, would like to uh, uh, if you would like to contribute, if you'd like to look on online, if you'd like to download parts, if you'd like to build something, uh, this project, it's not, uh, it's not something I want to impose, it's something, it's an invitation. So uh, please feel free to uh, contribute. Thank you. Hi, uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, your project is very inspiring. Um, but at the end of the day, I, I think the, um, all the project relies on, um, on modularity and um, it seems also to rely on this four centimeter grid. So, uh, and this grid is uh, at the same time on the plane. So uh, how is your experience after these many years of working with that? Uh, is this enough? This, uh, the definition of this four centimeter grid 
uh, it's enough to 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 organize uh, a sharing uh, system which uh, with uh, all these promises you you you're presenting I think it is, I think it's quite a good uh, I'm actually quite happy about uh, the grid that that was has been defined you know I'm happy it's because it kind of seems to work also because it builds further on existing standards so for example in order to get to this 4 by 4 first 6 months was nothing but just measuring what was there existing tables existing uh, 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 objects and just trying to figure out okay what are now the existing standards how, what could be a standard that plays with that, that builds on that. 4x4 four four comes of, uh, from 60x60, 60 60, which is a known standard in kitchens. Um, in transportation, we have the Euro pallets, which are 120x80. That holds the, the cardboard boxes that are 40x30. 30. Uh, so all of that, it's, it's very compatible with those kind of existing standards. And... Um, yeah, so it, it wasn't our intention to kind of uh, come up with a standard that would kind of uh, wipe everything off the table and just put something new, no, very much not. And it somehow seems to work, I think, at, at least until now. Yeah. Hi. Um, <clears throat> what... Um mechanisms, if any, do you have at the moment, or does the project have for moderating uh, the parts that people upload in terms of checking that they conform? What was the uh, question exactly? <laughs> what mechanisms or like system is there for to upload the, To upload things? Uh, I mean, to, more to make sure that the, the, the grid is being adhered to. And like, does that, does that involve someone have the role of testing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, at, at this point, it's not that we kind of. Um, also, I have to be honest. Like this, it's not. There's not that much contribution. So, at this point, so it's not that uh, we can't handle it on our own. So it's still kind of person to person. So, it's um, people upload something. I still can say like, uh, yeah, watch this or watch that or this should be. You know, maybe if you make it uh, uh, five milli millimeter, it becomes more compatible with much other parts and so on. But on the other hand, what you do see is that uh, certain parts are just more successful than others. And it's a kind of a natural selection, you know. So uh, certain parts, they just are picked up by other people and they build further on it. And, uh, uh, and so I think that's a very interesting mechanism to that, uh, that it just... Uh, corrects it by itself in a way and uh, and the parts that are very universal and that are uh, can be applied in many different ways are just the parts that start to float hi thomas thank you for the presentation and especially thank you for the project thank you my question is how about uh, the establishing of the open standard so how do you go from the proposal to actually a standard that is uh, used and adopted by many people? So what's your experience and your suggestion about having standards for uh, global collaboration? How, again, I'm sorry, I didn't really... How do you go from just the, the proposal of the standard and actually becoming a standard? Yeah, yeah, so that's ah, yeah, okay. The, the, the that's a very part. good question. And that's exactly where I am at this point, I think. And um, I think it really should, you know, like, uh, or... Uh, that should be my ambition, I think, to really, because if you really want to make it into a reality, you start to ask yourself different questions, you know? What's the uh, earning model here? How am I going to create incentives for people to upload things? Uh, what, how could it become interesting also for companies to produce? Uh, and so on. So um, that's, but like, it started as a research, and uh, so it was um, very much co-produced by Z33, which is a kind of a, 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 I would call it a lab for society, where you know artists and designers can try out things and we can experiment and we can see, okay, what what what's working, what's not working, and so throughout these six years, I was in this kind of safe lab, let's say, you know, and uh, doing uh, and being able to exhibit here and there, and that's all great, and I get feedback, and uh, but now I have to you know switch 180 degrees and start talking to people who are really doing it in a way, who are really producing and, and but they're of course coming with completely different questions. Um, 
which is very challenging, but also very, which is a, a big mind shift. And also the difficult, and I'm doing that huh, at this point, I'm really talking now to uh, producers and to uh, those other people, let's say, and I really want to, but on the other hand, I also don't want to bail out in a way like, uh, how do you, the ambition is really to create a, a system that is kind of so uh, cool that just people want to contribute to it. Because I think that's the model, those are the systems of the future that will be successful. Because I very much believe this system is, is only as big as the community that is willing to support it. So therefore it's also very fragile. So therefore you also have a lot of, it comes with a lot of responsibility. And if it's, it's it, uh, but I think that's a good, you know, that's a good uh, system to work in. This kind of uh, uh, place where you need to be very open and transparent about the decisions you make and you need to be very clear about why you're, you, why it, 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 it's working the way it does. But I don't have all the answers yet, but I never had them. Like at day one, you know, I had no idea. Like is it now four by four? At first it was five by five, you know, luckily we changed that. But um, I think what I learned is just by doing it and by every time taking a step, 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 uh, that, that uh, you just learn a lot about and you just, uh, you're able to improve and you're able to better understand things. But I, on the other hand, it's also never good. I think it's never a good motivator to try to go quick or go too quick because uh, I think that the motivation should be, okay, for myself to really better understand because that's a much more enriching experience. And it's better for the system in the end, I think. That's it. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>